Well, I have the privilege and truly the pleasure this afternoon to introduce you to our keynote speaker, Jeff Pegaeus. Jeff is very well known in homes across the country as the Chief National Affairs and Justice Correspondent for CBS News. Before his current role, Jeff was the Justice and Homeland Security Correspondent for CBS for about seven years. He appears often on the CBS Evening News with Nora O'Donnell, uh, which I watch religiously, and CBS Morning. Jeff also has a weekly national CBS News podcast, fittingly called America Changed Forever. Jeff has reported on the scene, on the ground, about many of the tragic events that our summit aims to prevent. He was at the 2014 shooting of Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri, the killing of George Floyd and Tyree Nichols, the mob attack on our Capitol on January 6, and the follow-up congressional hearings. He's covered threats to election workers, active shooter events, terrorist attacks, gun violence. Uh, he's interviewed ATF Chief Steve Dettelbach, who many of you know, was one of our keynote speakers last year. Twice this year already, Jeff has reported on the rise in mass shootings and thoughts on how to prevent them. Jeff's peers have recognized his exceptional reporting. He has earned three Emmy Awards for his reporting, as well as the Society of Professional Journalists Award for Excellence in Reporting. Jeff is the author of two books hitting critical issues of the day. One is called Black and Blue, Inside the Divide Between the Police and Black America. The other is Compromat, How Russia Undermined American Democracy. Both books well worth reading. Jeff attended Miami University of Ohio, in Oxford, Ohio, as I would say, the Miami University. It's the 10th oldest public university in the, in the United States. He has received an honorary doctorate from his alma mater and serves on its board of trustees. In Miami, Jeff not only received a degree in communications, but he starred as an all-conference receiver in football. As I know well, because he was continually shredding the defensive secondary of my hometown, University of Toledo Rockets. Um, he then went on and he played in the Canadian Football League before turning to his career in news broadcasting. And just to show that all roads lead to Pittsburgh in one way or another, Jeff's position coach while at Miami was Pat Narduzzi, now the head coach out at Pitt. In the great tradition of Walter Cronkite, who signed off each evening by saying, I remember this well, and that's the way it is. Jeff believes in investigating and reporting all sides of a story and reporting the facts, not the misinformation and false narratives the parade is news today. I mean, to be sure, we need more reporters like Jeff. So we are privileged today to have the opportunity to hear from Jeff. Please join me in welcoming Jeff Pegaeus. Well. I don't even recognize, recognize myself after that introduction. Uh, Chuck was very generous, and I do appreciate that. And I see all of you here. Some of you are eating. I hope that I don't disturb your lunch with something that I say. And you, know, you, you heard Chuck introduce me, and he listed all the stories that I've covered. And what I like to tell people, sadly, is when you see me coming, 
you know it's not a good sign. Okay, because for some reason, I always end up in the middle of chaos, and I don't know why that is. I seek peace, but for some reason, uh, I've covered all of these terrible stories. Um, and that's why I wanted to come here today. Thank you for the warm welcome as you eat. Uh, it's great to be here at the summit because I think it is important. One of the responsibilities I have at CBS News is covering the Department of Justice. And I often get emails from the Department of Justice. Some of, you know, some of them become stories for the evening news. Some of them become stories for the morning show or for radio. But oftentimes, I get emails that don't make news. And a lot of times, those emails from DOJ uh, pertain to hate crimes. So while you watch TV and you see all these hate crimes, there are many more happening across the country, some of which do not get reported. And so that's one of the reasons why I felt I wanted to be here today, because I think this work is important. You, many of you probably heard the DHS secretary yesterday talk about this issue, other people talking about this issue. What we're seeing in this country is to me, you know, as someone whose parents came from the South, it reminds me of the 60s. It reminds me of the civil rights struggle and what my parents went through uh, in the Jim Crow South. I'm not going to talk about that. But it's not lost on me that this summit is aligning with what's happening at the UN. Uh, where there is a global strategic development goal, and it's about promoting peaceful and inclusive societies, providing access to justice for all, and building effective, accountable, and inclusive institutions at all levels. People around the globe should be free of fear from all forms of violence. They should feel safe as they go about their daily lives. Whatever their ethnicity, whatever their faith, whatever their sexual orientation. To change what has become a culture of hate among some communities across the globe and here in the US, we're all gonna have to roll up our sleeves, and you know that, and that's why you're here. We're gonna have to work hard to change this narrative that some people in this country are embracing increasingly. That people of color, Jewish and Muslim Americans, undocumented immigrants and others are radical, dangerous, and un-American. Those are the kinds of words that give some people a license to act. And that's what I wanted to talk about here today. According to the FBI, the latest data available shows a real spike in hate crimes across the country. The FBI says that hate crime incidents in 2021, and that's the, the year with the latest statistics, the incidents rose to nearly 11,000, and that's the highest level recorded in more than two decades. You'll recall that not too long ago, when President Obama was elected, you had these so-called experts on television saying, hey, we're living in a post-racial society, isn't this fantastic? I mean, at the time, that's what it appeared to be. However, that might have been more wishful thinking than reality. 
What we've seen throughout the history of this country is that you have this hate in the community and it grows and it can lead to violence. But these are all events that can be prevented. One of the problems today is that we continue to see hate speech online. And then we're seeing, worst of all, these mass attacks on innocent Americans. In the anti-Semitic terrorist attack on October 27, 2018 here at the Tree of Life Synagogue that claimed 11 lives, including Holocaust survivors, that sadly, has sparked copycat acts, similar hate crimes across the country, and added perverse fuel to those already filled with a combination of rage, hate, and access to high-powered firearms. People who, as we speak, may or may not be psychologically unstable and are still trying to replicate that deadly rampage. Again, one that could have been prevented. And you shouldn't think for a minute that these things can't be prevented, because they can. I grew up overseas on the continent of Africa and in Europe, and then went to high school here in the US and college, as you now know, in Ohio. And during the early years of my, my life, I was, I was living overseas, so all I wanted to be is American. And, you know, I loved football, and every time I'd come back and see my grandparents, I'd sit down, I'd watch football, I'd watch Saturday cartoons, because that, to me, is what this country was about when I was a kid. Even overseas, they'd say, hey, do you have blue jeans? Do you have, do you play baseball? But getting to the point where I knew the reality and that naivete sort of washed away was because of my parents and how they raised me. My mother grew up in Montgomery, Alabama, in the Jim Crow South, including with her mom's cousin, Rosa Parks. And during the bus boycott, they all stopped riding the bus to send a message that they should not legally be required to ride in the back of any bus. And then my father, who grew up in Birmingham, Alabama, during that same period, he attended Morehouse College in Atlanta as an early admission student. And in the early spring of his freshman year, he joined a group of students and Martin Luther King Jr. in a peaceful demonstration in Atlanta. And my father was arrested for protesting segregated eating places. That was in downtown Atlanta. And for his actions, as an underage 16-year-old college student, then Fulton County Juvenile Court Judge W.W. W. Wolfuck, my father still remembers his name, demanded that he either be placed in a Georgia reform school or get out of the state by sundown. So these are the kinds of stories that I grew up with. And they inform me as a person. They still stick with me now. And so when I see what's happening in this country right now, that's what I think about. 
how is it that we've come so far but still have so far to go? How is it that in some ways history is repeating itself? Again, about stories that don't make the news. I, I saw some images of some people standing outside a synagogue. They were proudly holding up swastikas. They didn't have their faces covered. It was just seemed like every day for them. And I'm thinking to myself, how in the world is this happening in this day and age where people think it's okay to do that? And it's one of those stories that doesn't get a lot of coverage, but it's happening in this country. And more people need to be talking about it. We as journalists need to be doing more about it. Because what people of color through the history of this country have experienced, what my parents went through in the Jim Crow South, where people of color were made to feel less than. You couldn't share water fountains, couldn't sit in the white-only section of restaurants. The list of indignities go on and on and on. And think about it. That was only 60 years ago. It feels like eons ago. But it was only 60 years ago that three little black girls were killed while attending church in Birmingham, Alabama by a bomb planted by members of the KKK. Just 60 years ago. And for some, it might seem like 100 years ago, but it's not. And it's still fresh in the minds of millions of Americans, the stories of the evils of slavery, the heroes of the civil rights struggle, the survivors of the Holocaust. They still stick with me at this time when some people want to bury that. They want to sweep that kind of history under the rug. the heroes and the stories of the civil rights movement. They want to sweep that under the rug. The resiliency of Jewish Americans and people of color are stories of courage and determination to not only help change society for the better and make the world a better place, but also to expose what's really happening. These things are happening in our communities. And, you know, I don't know if racism will ever disappear and lead to that period of history where people truly judge each other by the content of their character. But I do know that through events like this and the summit's proposed structured output of steps to combat hate, We can be frank about what the reality is in this country right now and how to make things better for all Americans. But it's going to take what I think Pittsburgh knows best, frankly. It's going to take hard work. It's going to take rolling up your sleeves. It's going to take a continued march forward to get the truth out, to make sure that misinformation doesn't run rampant. Throughout my 30-year career, my goal, the reason I got into this business was to hold public officials accountable. And sometimes that can get lost in the the daily grind of covering news. But it is important to hold these public officials accountable for what they say and what they do. Because as many of you know in this room, what they say is having consequences 
for Americans across this country. Americans of all different cultural backgrounds. And that's why I think this coming year right now is important to talk about these issues. Because public officials need to be held accountable for what they say to you, what they say to their constituents. Because what I do is observe these politicians, I observe law enforcement, and what I see is the kind of thing I haven't seen before in my 30-year career, and that is just people blatantly lying about what's going on and not being held accountable. That's why it's important that we have journalists who are aggressive in seeking the truth and seeking the answers that the American people deserve. You know, we're not last, I don't know, five, six years of journalism has been hard because not only is the news cycle never ending, but you have politicians trying to diminish journalists and what they try to do, which is hold them accountable. And of course, it's not just journalists who've been targeted by these politicians, but it's also other important institutions that are critical to this democracy. What we've seen over the last decade is misinformation run amok. We've seen politicians doing their best to spread misinformation, and what has become clear to me is the strategy behind it. They want to stir people up. They want to get people to look away from the real problems. They want to want people to focus on other things rather than you don't have the job that you need to support your family. Or you know, that factory is going to come back when it's not. Why don't we build jobs for the future? Pittsburgh did that. So we have to do better, all of us, but especially the politicians who seek to take what I think is the easy road to victory which is by dividing people, or intentionally turning back the clock and restricting the rights of Americans to vote. How is that happening? And those are just the facts. Those are the facts. That's what I see. Why not take the high road? And in, instead of promising people things that will not exist in the future, promise them a future by offering them real opportunities. What I see in this country is that people have been given a license to hate because some political leaders have said, hey, it's wrong to be politically correct. They say, hey, just say what's on your mind, it's okay. And while that may sound like freedom of speech, it's actually not freedom at all. What it is is a lack of respect for others, a lack of decorum that can become a license for people to single other people out, a license to just come out and say whatever is on your mind without being considerate of other people's feelings. This country has always been a melting pot where people come together 
from different cultural backgrounds and change things. Innovate. As we enter this upcoming election, keep a close eye on the candidates who talk about a brighter future, a better, more tolerant society, and economic opportunity for all Americans. You don't hear them do that a lot these days. Why? Why not? Why not? Because I think no matter who you are in this room, no matter where you come from, no matter what your cultural background is, the thing that we all share is that desire for our families to do better, for generations of our families to progress, to get a job so we can put food on the table. But we don't hear our leaders talk about those things enough. When people are suffering, they often look to blame others and make excuses. And that's what we have to guard against. Because it's often that kind of thinking that can lead to violence. As it did in the South when my father and my mother were growing up there, they could have been bitter. They could have lashed out, and others who sought, you know, peaceful solutions to the challenges of that time, the Jim Crow South and, and other challenges that people across this country faced. You could get bitter, you could look for excuses, or you can do something positive to change this country this society for the better. And as someone who spent his adult life observing people, covering really difficult stories to cover, someone who's lived over, all over the world, I've seen a lot. And most of it has been good. And that's why I believe in this country. Gosh, does it sound like I'm running for office? I'm really not. But it's true. This is, this is the greatest country on earth. But we have to start acting like it. And yeah, I'm not saying this as a politician. I'm saying this as a journalist who's seen so many different realities of life. And Chuck mentioned Walter Cronkite. Back in the day, that's what Walter Cronkite and David Brinkley would do. And I'm not putting myself in that category. But we see the good and the bad. And our job as journalists is to inform all Americans about the good and the bad. And then press politicians about, well, how are you going to fix this? How are you going to fix that? Why did you say one thing and you're doing the opposite? And that's why I say right now, if you want to see a change in hate crimes going down rather than up, this presidential season that's upcoming, think about that. Think about what leaders locally leaders on school boards, leaders in Congress, leaders 
in the Oval Office are saying. Think about it. What concerns me is that there's still too many people, and some of them really intelligent people, who take this misinformation and they ingest it. And you can't say anything to change their minds. But we have to keep getting the truth out there and making sure that public officials are held accountable for the things that they say. Because just like Kennedy in the 60s, just like LBJ, it takes leadership to overcome the kind of issues that we're talking about today. It starts at the top. And unless you have people at the top, at all levels, talking about these issues as they are, then we will continue to see these numbers go in the wrong direction. And that's why summits like this are important. And that's why I wanted to be here. Because this was something that I felt compelled to talk about because I've just seen too much in the last three or four years where you're just thinking, what is happening? So again, I hope I did not ruin your lunch that's just the reality. And that's the way I see this country right now. Thanks for your time. <laughs>